building our homes and our cities for a sustainable future. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, our ambition with our Netting Zero series is to elevate solutions in the climate debate and to create a platform for a more informed and diverse conversation around climate action. We will continue these virtual episodes as we approach COP26 this November, where we will present the New York Times Climate Hub, a 10-day hybrid event in Glasgow, as well as virtually. It will be a destination for innovators, youth change makers, community members, business leaders, policymakers, artists, and yourself to discuss and debate scalable climate solutions. And if you would like to learn more about the hub, visit us at nytclimatehub.com. Today's discussion will be led by my colleague, Mark Landler, the London Bureau Chief at the New York Times. In his more than 27 years at the Times, Mark Landler has been the Bureau Chief in Hong Kong and Frankfurt, a White House correspondent, a European economic correspondent, and a business reporter in New York. We are thrilled to have him moderate our discussion today. Before I hand it over to Mark, I want to introduce a few questions the audience has submitted for our speakers today. How do we integrate the built environment as part of larger regenerative and circular solutions? How do we further incentivize green building and energy efficiency upgrades for building owners? And how do we overcome the split incentive problem? How can emerging countries effectively manage sustainability while taking structural problems, such as poverty and inequality, into account? How do we ensure that building energy-efficient housing does not come at the expense of leaving out low-income communities? What are the most effective actions the average citizen can take to prioritise the redesign of greener American cities? Thank you so much for those incredible questions. I also want to encourage those of you who are watching now on YouTube to submit your questions through the live stream chat function where we will be checking. With that, I will hand it over to Mark to lead us through today's discussion with our dynamic panelist. Welcome, Mark. Thank you, Whitney. Thank you also to the audience for your pointed questions and curiosity about how climate impacts the built environment and practically what this means for people and businesses. Thank you to all of you for joining from home and work. Actually, I'm very interested to know where everyone is tuning in from and how your personal built environment has changed due to the pandemic. Please drop your questions and comments into the YouTube chat function throughout the session below. I'm certainly looking forward to seeing an engaging dialogue unfold. I'm Mark Landler, the London Bureau Chief of the New York Times, and I'm joining you from my office in London. I'm still largely alone here, as most Times employees have yet to return to the office. But I'm thrilled to welcome you to a conversation with experts from diverse backgrounds and experiences. We will discuss how the pandemic has turbocharged the debate around climate change, how we interact with the built environment, and how we are reimagining the functionality, sustainability, and beauty of what is built or not built all around us. I'm intrigued to hear what insights our speakers will bring and how solutions from greener communities can seek to strengthen inclusivity by design. Over the past year and a half, the pandemic has forced radical changes in how we live, work, and savor the space around us. We've seen a direct link between the way we move and belong in communities and our mental and physical health. As a small portion of workers have fled the cities in search of more green space, and flexible work and home environments, others have not had that luxury, making them more susceptible to the health consequences of living in densely populated cities. The pandemic has laid bare deeply rooted strains of inequality in our society. We have leaned on those most disproportionately affected to keep the day-to-day -day gears 
of our economy turning. And this shift is just a foretaste of what we expect to come as a consequence of the changing climate. We will need to both adapt to and mitigate further risk that comes with the impacts of climate change. And crucially, we will have to accelerate the implementation of solutions that will create greener buildings, systems, and structures in the communities that we live in. All of this raises several key questions. How can we ensure we reconcile the green transition with the way we are reconstructing, retrofitting, and designing for equity, inclusion, and resilience? How can businesses, governments, civil society groups, and individuals collaborate to achieve more inclusion and sustainability? What exciting innovations might help us reimagine the historic ways that we live, work, and move throughout our communities? I'll now turn it over to Nigel Topping, the high-level climate champion for COP26, the United Nations Climate Conference, which is happening this November in Glasgow in Scotland. Hello, Nigel. I'm so glad you're here with us. Well, thank you, Mark. It's great to be with you. It's also great to see so many uh, questions coming in from the audience. Let's keep them coming. Well, we all know that the built environment is, is crucial for this challenge. It accounts for approximately 40% of global carbon emissions, uh, including about 11% um, from the materials, from the embodied materials. So, so the sector building instruction is going to be crucial um, if we're going to reach our goal of net zero by 2050. And, and we also know that the role of cities is going to be crucial because over half of urban emissions come from buildings. So that the, the relationship between cities and the built environment um, is going to be essential to transform the sector. Good news is that cities are very much in motion. Over 700 have joined the race to zero, um, which means they've got robust long-term targets and short-term plans. Um, those leading cities are all over the world. They include Tokyo, Medellin, Copenhagen, uh, Vancouver, New York, and, and Joburg. Um, and so they're committed to at least 50% reduction in embodied emissions by 2030, and then all buildings to be net zero across the full life cycle by 2050, so net zero. It's important to say that it's not just about reducing emissions. It's also about addressing um, climate vulnerability. Um, 1.6 billion people live in urban slums, um, uh, really exposed to the extremes of heat um, and the lack of water. We know that over a thousand cities could be subjected to extreme heat events by 2050 and over 500 cities suffering from lack of water, as well of, as course of all the coastal cities that are subject to sea level rise. So we're going to need to see cities working with companies and other stakeholders around the whole built environment system to take collective action in, in, in sync um, to create a sustainable net zero and resilient future for everyone. If those stakeholders do not take bold action now, the beginning of the 20s, we risk locking in emissions and uh, vulnerability into our buildings and our infrastructure uh, that will affect generations to come. So that's why we believe that commitments to decarbonizing and increasing resilience right now, this year, 2021, are so important to drive action and prevent those crises. Uh, we get a quadruple win from this. We get jobs, we get climate action, we get economic development, and we get increased well-being for city dwellers. The fact that so many new buildings will be required over the coming decades gives us a real opportunity to build back from COVID better than before to ensure that we only have quality buildings that are right for the climate and the people who inhabit them. So the challenge is to convert the entire built environment ecosystem to align with net zero by 2050, um, whilst leveraging infrastructure to reduce vulnerability. That's going to require radical collaboration between cities and built environment stakeholders to overcome what's often a very fragmented value chain and to signal to national policymakers um, that we're, the whole of society is moving and we need that national policy support. What you are doing today um, will determine whether or not new buildings are at net zero carbon by 2030 and all buildings by 2050. And it will determine whether we are addressing the historic inequalities um, 
such that this transition is going to benefit all people, especially the most vulnerable. That's the challenge. Tackle the decarbonisation and address vulnerability that's embedded in much of our current infrastructure. Thank you. Thank you, Nigel. I now have the pleasure of introducing our first set of panellists, Pierre-André, Margaret and Gillian. Welcome all. I'm thrilled to speak with you today, and I'm looking forward to hearing all of you draw out the connection between climate change and the built environment, discuss what challenges we face, what we are currently doing, and what more we need to do to overcome these challenges. In Nigel's challenge, he stressed the urgency of accelerating climate solutions in the built environment now in order to have a chance at fulfilling our short-term and long-term net zero ambitions. I would like each of you to first give me your rapid fire responses to this question. From where you sit, how can your industry lead the transition to a built environment where we fulfill net zero commitments and actions in this decisive decade and ensure we reach net zero by 2050. Jillian, I'll start with you. From your perspective in real estate and development, what would you say? Well, thank you, Mark. Let me start with a, a couple of numbers. Uh, global spend on construction uh, last year stood at 5.8 trillion US dollars. Within that, for every one dollar spent on energy efficiency measures, 37 dollars are spent on traditional uh, non-energy efficient construction and building methodologies. So that gives you an idea of the gap that we have in terms of uh, construction. And I think we would all agree that uh, urbanisation, whilst it has uh, been somewhat paused by the pandemic, is here to stay uh, and there will be a lot of new buildings uh, as we've just heard we need to really step up the materials that we're using and the way that we're constructing those buildings if we're going to have any chance of addressing the challenge thanks Gillian. so pierre andre from your vantage point at one of the world's largest construction companies designing and producing materials and solutions for the built environment what is your response to that question? Well, I think there is two, two, two parts of the question. There is the, the new buildings when I talk, uh, and then there is the renovation. In new building, we have already a number of countries where the regulations mean that all buildings which are built, and it started maybe 10, 10 years ago, are not net zero, but are very, very low emitting when they are built. So for me, the, in, the, in the mature countries, the biggest part is renovation. Uh, so we need to, to speed up renovation. The Green Deal in Europe is part of the answer, but we need to really move very fast. In the uh, new uh, emerging countries, the issue is more new build, and, we need, and then we don't have today uh, the regulation which may ensure that we are building uh, already right from the first place, if I can say. So there are two big different challenges. We, te technically, we know how to do it in both cases. Uh, with the materials we, we have. So it's more a question of, of industrializing the renovation and having the right regulations for new builds. Gotcha. So Margaret, how about from your perspective uh, in the world of finance to that same question? Yeah, you know, I would say, you know, not to repeat anything that's that's already been said. I mean, I think the first big piece is just, of course, the acknowledgement, right? Just to understand that climate change and the built environment, of course, inextricably linked. So they're the pieces that are, of course, obvious, just the amount of carbon uh, emissions that are really driven by not just real estate development, but just the, you know, the operations of, of real estate. And so I think from a business perspective and even specifically an investing perspective, we need to seek out the opportunities where we can make the biggest changes. And so, for example, you know, I really loved how, how Nigel really spelled out very clearly that these are issues that are clearly not going to touch all populations equally. And so one of the things that we can also do is really focused on underserved populations and underserved neighborhoods. So just as one example, if we look at workforce housing, for example, in the United States, so much of that are older vintage buildings. And so by making improvements to those buildings, we can make a big difference knowing that some 
LED light changes, more efficient boilers, uh, more efficient building envelopes, these are not um, very complicated technologies. And yet when we apply them to older vintage buildings, we're going to have a big impact. And we're also going to be impacting some of the communities that we know are going to be most impacted negatively by the impacts of climate change. Thank you very much. Um, I've already heard a couple of themes repeat themselves. Um, I, I, I have one question I wanted to throw out to any of you really who, who may have a perspective on it. Um, for a long time, the construction and real estate sector, as well as the financial sector, um, have been a source of tremendous amount of emissions. Now that you're recognizing the value of the green transition and decarbonizing your industries, how are you bringing your shareholders and other stakeholders along on the journey? Do they recognize the value of the green transition and net zero commitments? Or is it a struggle to bring them along? Do you get pushback from them? Uh, so I, I'd be happy to ask either Margaret from her perspective in the financial industry. Obviously, Pierre-Andre Andre has been thinking about this, I'm, I'm sure, for years and years. Would one of you like to take a crack at that? Sure. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll give a perspective. And, and almost it's, it's almost worth flipping the question on, it, on its head a little bit. I think in some ways our stakeholders are bringing us along. I mean, one of, one of the exciting things about the built environment and the real estate industry is that everyone is our customer, right? Our residential tenants, our office tenants, the you know, people who walk into a grocery store every day. So it's very universal, of course, in who it touches. And I think more and more people talk about you know, millennials and, and their preferences, but it really is everyone. And so when we are selling condos or renting buildings, People want to be in lead buildings. People want to know that the space they're in is sustainable and is part of the progress that we're all looking for around climate change. And so I think in a lot of ways, uh, it's the, the conversation's really changing. It's not so much how we're bringing our stakeholders along, but how we're also responding to what our stakeholders are, quite frankly, demanding from us. Same for you, Pierre-Andre. And then I'll ask Jillian the same from her perspective. Go ahead. I think the, the, the investor community is uh, moving very fast on these issues. But, uh, you know, they want numbers and they want that, uh, to make sure we are serious. And from that standpoint, uh, in a company like saint gobain there are two sides of the coin. There is uh, the biggest part, which is that the materials we produce are saving a lot of energy and CO2 when they are installed. Uh, but that is not very easy to measure. And then there is our own footprint. You know, we are part of the solution, but we are also part of the problem that to make these materials, we emit CO2. And then we have very strong objectives. We, for for Saint-Gobain, you know, we are like many large companies. We have decided to engage uh, to be net zero by 2050 in our own production uh, with intermediate target by 2030. And that we have metrics. And I think our investors are more and more looking and taking us to our words. Uh, so there are two sides, but globally, I would say the investor community is moving very fast and is going to be a big uh, positive factor going ahead, I think. Thanks. Thanks, Pierre-André. Uh, Gillian, same question to you. BRE, I, I gather, uh, turned 100 years old this year. Do you feel like your stakeholders are, are pulling you along or are you having to drag them along? Well, we, it's a very good, very good way of putting it. We have been attempting to drag customers along for and governments for 30 years. Uh, we've really seen a sea shift, though, um, as uh, others have said. There is much more pressure coming um, via the investment community, clearly. And I think that uh, employees are playing their part, shareholders are beginning to see both the business case, but also the need to de-risk um, their portfolios and for uh, investors are playing their part in pushing that with much greater scrutiny. Um, so I think there's a number of factors all coming together uh, at last to, uh, to drive much more rapid action. Um, what I think is missing, I'm sure we'll come to this, is the uh, often the government, or the, uh, all levels of government playing their part because however much investment the uh, industry puts into this, it needs to be matched by much greater funding in my view from governments. Uh, it's not going to happen just through markets. Thanks. Um, I wanted to zero in, if I could, on one or two specific initiatives that, that you all are pursuing. And, and Margaret, the One Million Black Women initiative really um, you know, jumped out at me 
as an example of how finance can accelerate the green transition in the built environment. This initiative is already at uh, quite a large scale. And, and my question is, how can other financial institutions learn from this model uh, in order to achieve the ambition set out for the industry as a whole? So maybe talk a little bit about that. Yeah, you know, I guess a, a couple of the things that I note about the initiative that I think are really transferable to um, certainly the issue of, of climate transition that we're trying to solve is, one, it's, and Pierre touched on this a little bit, right, the numbers, it's incredibly data-driven. So as we thought about the pillars that we wanted to focus on with one million black women, you know, we explored the racial wealth gap in the United States, and then we very quantitatively broke it down into all of the causes. So housing, education, health care, workforce and wages. And then that's where we're focusing, really driving the commercial solutions to narrow those opportunity gaps. And then the other piece about the, the initiative that I think can be um, somewhat of an example is really listening to black women as we think about what the challenges are and what the solutions are, right? Goldman Sachs has certainly the expertise, the capital, the investing know-how, but in terms of trying to impact that community, we knew that we needed to be really putting their voices at the center. And so, you know, stepping back and, and thinking about climate change, and I, you know, I, I just really keep going back to this comment that Nigel made because I, I, I found it so important. When he talked about climate change, he really did break it down into the populations that are impacted. And so as we think about all these solutions, whether it's in building materials, how we build, uh, you know, the renovations versus the new construction, I think we also need to be rooting those solutions in, in those communities and making sure that it actually, you know, is a solution and is right for the people that we're trying to impact. So just one example with um, climate change, of course, you know, renovation, energy efficiency, like that's actually going to drive down costs for for families and individuals. And when we're driving down costs, especially for low income families, electricity costs, utilities, those are some of the highest expenses for those families. And so really putting their thoughts in the center of it, making sure that we can be efficient, um, no pun intended, and sort of solve multiple challenges at the same time, I think can really just just move us forward and, and really help us accelerate as we're trying to address these issues. Um, thanks, uh, Margaret. Um, we're, we're running short on this uh, panel and, and we've, we've barely scratched the surface. So um, Jillian, remind me, I want to ask you about the BREAM initiative. And Pierre-Andre, before you go, I want to hear you tell me what your vision of a desirable city is. What are the elements that to you make a, a city desirable? I know that's a matter uh, that you've given a great deal of thought to. Um, so, uh, but, but, but sadly, our time for this session uh, has come to an end. So I'm going to leave it there for now. The good news is I, I'm going to be circling back with all of you uh, in the upcoming session. So we'll have a chance to continue this conversation. Thanks. I now want to bring in Her Excellency Elizabeth Thompson, who is Barbados Ambassador with Responsibility for Climate Change, Small Island Developing States, and the Law of the Sea. Welcome, Ambassador. We're thrilled to have you with us today. Thank you so much, Mark. I am thrilled to join you. Ambassador, it would be great to hear from you based on your long career in development, why climate change and the built environment are so interconnected. What major challenges have you already seen in this space? And what are you expecting to see in the coming years? Perhaps I could start at the with your last question. I expect to see the issue worsening unless we take interventions which affect substantial change. What have I seen? I've seen in, uh, in 2017, the entire population of Barbuda have to relocate as a result of a hurricane. And we are now in the Caribbean in hurricane season, June to October. I have seen the island of Dominica lose 225% of its GDP in a matter of hours. I've spoken to the people of Dominica who talk about the terror of the night when in the darkness, boulders came down from the mountains with winds at 175 miles per hour and people were in fear of their lives. I saw almost all of Dominica uprooted and 95% of, of its housing stock 
and infrastructure destroyed. That tells you people live in buildings. We work in buildings. We are social creatures and we operate in green spaces. When the natural environment is destroyed, when the built environment is decimated, then the human space is severely compromised. So we have to think in terms of how climate change impacts the built environment, how it impacts lives, livelihoods, the way people live, the way they work, the way they take recreation. And therefore, what I'm seeing globally, as well as in the Caribbean, is an increase in extreme weather in events, increase in the, in the number, and an increase in the intensity of such events with severe and adverse impacts on the built environment, which compromise people's quality to live, to recreate, and to have a, a good standard of living, to have a good livelihood. Uh, um, so I said, I started by saying where I'm expecting it to go if we don't intervene. I've indicated how I see the challenge now. And to frame it in the policy context, what is absolutely essential is the structuring of appropriate policy interventions that will cause mitigation that will cause adaptation to the impacts of climate change so that those who live in small island developing states like my own can withstand those impacts because for us the threat is existential. Thank you Ambassador and it's always helpful as a reminder to those of us who don't live in those uh, vulnerable places just how harrowing the human toll of all this is so I appreciate you going through some of that. I wondered whether I could bring the conversation to specifically Barbados. Um, are there some policies and initiatives that the Barbadian government has pursued that you could share with us in this area to give us a sense of what you're doing to help mitigate these effects, to sort of plan for the future that you sketched out? Yes, of course. Barbados is has developed what we are calling a Roofs to Reefs program. Our the number two RP, roofs to reefs. And essentially, it is an integrated policy solution where we start with everything, the roof, from the roof to the seabed, uh, to deal with all of the impacts of climate change. So let me give you an example. For instance, in terms of the built environment, we are upgrading our building codes to ensure that roofs have hurricane traps, that houses have hurricane shutters, that all properties have appropriate insurance, that our building codes will meet the impacts of a, up to a category four hurricane and may be able in some circumstances to withstand a category five hurricane. We are addressing issues such as utilities, ensuring that they're all underground. As you know, in, in high winds, utility poles will collapse. Water services that are above ground will be destroyed. And therefore, insofar as the services, utility services can be put underground, this is being addressed. We are addressing issues like solid waste. But we are doing other things, like ensuring that we take steps to protect the blue economy, ensuring livelihoods for people. Because coming out of this, we are moving to uh, a net zero carbon economy, and the target is to do so by 2030. So we, we protect the seabed, we protect our reef and structures, we develop a proper blue economy, we protect the built structures on land, uh, properties of all types, and we deal with infrastructure. And Roofs to Reefs, therefore, is a comprehensive, integrated policy solution which protects the natural environment as well as the built environment and we are developing it i know mark that you are very interested in working with the private sector and we are developing policy solutions solutions in such a way that the private sector can invest in some of these programs and therefore not only generate jobs but foreign exchange and revenues but i'll pause here because i know that you want to ask a question 
Well, I, I, I'm very interested with the way you've expressed it as roofs to reefs, because that really resonates with the average person. I guess my, my final question to you would be, what is the best way to educate your citizenry about these issues? I mean, sometimes they can seem a bit abstract and academic. So for you in Barbados, what have you found to be the most effective way to tell the ordinary family about how urgent this problem is and the role they can play in helping to solve it? Frankly, Mark, I don't think that climate change is abstract for Caribbean people or for small, small island developing states. Uh, if you go to the Maldives, where they can actually see the terrestrial space sinking into the marine space, you know, it, it's very real. Uh, where people have had in the Pacific to leave islands because of coastal inundation. In Barbados, where the coastlines are impacted, where we are now having um, uh, severe excesses of sargassum seaweed, where um, the, the heating of the uh, marine temperature is impacting on the habitats of marine flora and fauna. Fishermen see it in a very real way. We see it at the table in a very real way by what is available and what is not. So it is, it is a lived experience. It is not a conversation about what could happen or what may be happening in a very um, far off uh, situation. And let me make a, a contrast, if I may. When Hurricane Katrina to, uh, hit um, the United States, the Gulf states were impacted. Life went on for the rest of the United States. It wasn't, it didn't have the same meaning. When Hurricane Dorian hit the Bahamas, there was nobody who escaped. The entire country, even though it is an archipelago, was affected. How do we reach people? I think that what Barbados is attempting to do is to build a community-based understanding and intervention so that people in communities know how they can contribute to protecting themselves, to making their lives better, to ensuring that we have faster post uh, post-disaster recovery in the event of an extreme weather event so that they can change their practices and behaviors and take steps that uh, cause them to adapt to and mitigate against climate change impact. In a nutshell, that is what we are attempting to do. You know, Ambassador, you made a very valid point that it is not at all an academic or abstract issue to people who live in these vulnerable places. And I think that's an important point for those of us who have the luxury of not living in those places to always keep in mind. I just want to thank you again for such a wonderful and rich conversation and for being here with us today. Thank you so much, Ambassador Thompson. Thank you very much, Mark. I have been honored to join the New York Times team and to join you, of course. I look forward in particular to seeing you at COP26, where Barbados is proposing to submit an, a very strong NDC, which will meet the 1.5 degree uh, Celsius uh, target. And you know, for us, the issues of climate change are extremely important to our daily lives. And therefore, I am happy to share with your audience what the experience of Barbadians and those of us who live in the Caribbean and in small island states, what our experiences are. Looking, for, looking forward to seeing you there. See you in Glasgow. Now I'd like to bring in our second group of speakers to discuss how to reimagine and redesign existing systems so that green solutions can bring about equity in our communities. Welcome Tony, Christina, and Sheila. I would like to ask each of you for your rapid responses and reflections on what you've heard so far. In a minute or less, could you each tell me what resonated with you and what would you like to discuss further? Christina, I'll start with you. Thank you so much. Well, what has resonated with me is like the alignment of the momentum of the importance of accelerating the action towards decarbonizing the built environment, but bringing the resiliency factor into the conversation, meaning that we should always be thinking about people in place, culture, inclusivity, and bringing that conversation home to make all this change that is necessary relevant for communities to really scale up the solutions we need. Um, thank you very much. Tony, what did you think? 
Um, hi, and thank you, Mark, uh, for having me. Um, I, you know, I was struck by, and, and think it is very important for us to understand um, that because 40% of emissions are coming from the built environment, um, but that distribution of that built environment and the quality of that built environment is uh, unequal. Uh, thus, we have climate vulnerability uh, affecting certain populations in certain parts of the world. And so to see those things as interconnected, I think, uh, was really quite on point in, in Nigel's comments. Um, and then secondly, the, the conversation from the first panel about the emphasis on repurposing and rebuilding, particularly in climate vulnerable um, areas of our cities. So I'd love to come back and talk a little bit more about that. Great. And Sheila, what, what struck you? So listening to the ambassador from Barbados talking about roofs, this is the reality of the 1.4 billion people who live informally in the global south which never gets touched by the construction industry. You talk about refurbishing old houses, but you have 40 to 50% of our cities in the global south that are informal, that are considered squatters and illegal. And projections tell us that climate episodes are going to bring another huge, they're going to double the population by 2050 in cities. So you're not only talking about the deficit that's there today, no water, no sanitation, no health facilities, uh, no, no housing material that is not secondhand or has to be refurbished and destroyed by any climate event. Nobody's talking about that. And I think that all of you who are in the formal construction business, you, I think, have a duty and an obligation to produce materials that poor people who don't get subsidies, who don't have finance, who have to build bit by bit, have an opportunity to produce resilient homes. So communities and networks like mine are doing exactly what uh, you said before in the previous panel, there was this discussion about black women in the United States, saying, ask them what they want. So we're saying, ask poor people what they need. And I don't see panels, I don't see the construction industry seeing this as a mechanism to leapfrog in a very big way if they make investments in R&D related to these populations. We're talking about 2 billion people. Th thank you very much, Sheila. And um, I, I think uh, you've raised about a question that Pierre-André and perhaps Gillian could take a crack at later on and might 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 really want to um but but before we do that let me let me circle back to um something tony was getting at in her first answer We've obviously talked a lot in recent months about all the moving and shifting that's happened in cities um as a result of the pandemic and the disproportionate impact that's had uh, on the labor force and in particular on some of the most vulnerable um elements of our society um and so tony i'd, I'd like to put the question to you and ask, how can we ensure uh, that our cities make the transition to net zero uh, without leaving anyone behind? It seems like a, like a very big ambition, obviously something you've thought about a lot. What would you say are the key elements in that effort? Well, it's really interesting. Um, if we go back uh, 50 years or so, uh, during previous economic crises and energy and environmental crises, we were also seeing population shifts from cities to suburbs and what we called urban sprawl. Uh, we were seeing white flight here in the United States from the inner city, uh, deepening racial segregation in a lot of our cities, driven by the same um, um, context uh, that we're talking about today. So I think it's important that we don't repeat uh, those missteps and that we learn from them. Um, we've made great strides in working towards smarter growth uh, of our regions, of our cities, and at the same time, adapting and aligning our infrastructure and logistics systems around smart growth, which means smart density. So one of the things that we're gonna have to keep track of as we're looking to reinvest and shore up our vulnerable populations, and I'd like to start really putting a face on those. I think Sheila's exactly right. Um, how are we connecting to uh, people most in need. I think the, the health pandemic showed us that those people most in need are our essential workers. 
Um, so putting a bit more of a face on how we're connected to them in the work that we do every day is essential. And so um, how we think about reinvesting in those areas that I've already seen through urban sprawl and white flight uh, vacant lands in communities that are, are generations now of blight um, that are creating these heat island effects that we haven't solved for. So how are we thinking about smart growth reinvestment in inner cities like that? Um, how are we thinking about on a regional scale growth boundaries uh, and how we're using land use regulations and controls to think about um, what we're building new and where, because this can only um, exacerbate uh, the amount of energy we're spending, um, impacts on how we're investing in infrastructure that's going in the opposite direction of what we've been working for over the last 50 years. So I think land use regulations, smart growth, thinking about um, reinvesting in the communities of our essential workers is going to be very important. I, I think that actually leads uh, very well into what Christina has been working on and thinking about. Um, the World Green Building Council is a network that facilitates collaboration in the built environment uh, at the local level. And I'm wondering, Christina, whether you could talk a bit about how your organization thinks through accelerating action through commitments like the net zero carbon buildings uh, commitment. Yes, thank you for that. Um, so uh, back in 2018, we set out a set of principles to advance net zero, uh, no way behind the urgency of the 1.5 degree scenario. And uh, with that, many companies and cities are on the journey to advancing 2030 goals earlier than the race to 2050. <laughs> so those are showing the way and paving the way on what's the right kind of um, solutions that could be deployed now that shorten the journey that others can get inspired and in particular that policymakers can take forwards. And I guess in a, in a very in a very collaborative way that inspires and brings up all boats and uh, makes everyone uh, take hold of the best principles to improve infrastructure. And and for us also at World GPC and the local networks in 70 countries, it is that those best principles that we know can be done today uh, can apply to every sort of solution, including affordable housing and informal settlements. So. So I think the conversation is big and broad. There's a lot of opportunity and we advance and we're very much in partnership with the high level champions in the race to zero and race to resiliency. Could I wrap up maybe with a very quick answer from Sheila? You, you, you raised a very provocative point earlier when you were talking about the informal uh, sector and how it's often neglected in these conversations. I don't want to ask you what industry should do. We can hear from Pierre-André about that later. I want to ask you what kind of governmental action will make the built environment more accessible and equitable? And how can we ensure that communities have a role in putting these policies in place? So first of all, most of our Southern cities are trying to imitate Northern colonial cities. Our city centers are built like your 18th and 19th century city centers. You have colonial cities where poor people are pushed on the periphery but are needed all the time to service everybody. So you have a very pre-industrial kind of setup of cities. So all these wonderful things you guys are talking about are like 100 years ahead for us. So I feel that not only that, when you talk about smart, the way in which smart cities are discussed in the global south is how do you seduce foreign direct investment in our cities and how can we make part of our cities more efficient, uh, exciting, have business centers that has nothing to do with the ethnicity of the city that is around you. So we are dealing with governments, with municipalities, which are deeply flawed in their aspirations. So the rhetoric of climate is very superficial. The rhetoric of leaving nobody behind is very, very, very flaky. And the other very important thing is 93% of all people who live in informal settlements build their homes incrementally. They don't follow any of the principles, strategies, designs that all of you talk about. So you need another form of architecture 
because the government does not have our government would need a huge percentage of their gdp if they had to do it and they don't have it and they don't want to spend it so we're talking about serious informal private sector and i would challenge all of you to say just like in the north you are looking at different things you work with all of us we are net, huge networks of informal settlements to help us understand how to get into this business because we know it's a business but the formal private sector has no relationship with us so i invite you i am part of the resilience so i invite you all to be part of that sheila thank you very much i think this uh session uh has sort of wrapped up it's been a very nice mix of promising uh solutions and um some fairly provocative questions so i hope we'll be able to uh tackle that in the next session. Thank you very much. So th thank thank you again. I I want at this point to bring in our three speakers uh from the first session. Uh that's uh Margaret, Pierre-André and Gillian uh and allow them to interact with uh our last three speakers and and uh and I think frankly our last three speakers threw up a couple of um of uh, fairly big challenges. Uh and maybe what I'd start with is um is what Sheila said, uh, which is that the informal housing sector, uh, which is massive, uh, is is not often talked about in her view uh, or taken seriously by the construction industry. And uh, and she'd like to hear more from the construction industry on what its ideas are. Uh, Pierre Andre, you run one of the biggest construction companies. Why don't you uh, take a crack at that and make uh, Sheila feel better, <laughs> if you can? No, yeah, well, I, I don't have all the answers, but I can tell you, Sheila, your point is very important. And it's a challenge I've given to my teams a few years ago. And we have a, a, a dedicated R&D center in Saint-Gobain, which is uh, in, uh, in Chennai, in India, which uh, goal is to find solutions for the, the challenge you, you mentioned. We have some parts of the answer, but I must say we still have a lot of work to do. And it's a big challenge to find very affordable materials which uh, can fit, but it's clearly a, a big opportunity and a big need. So, so I am with you. Uh, and, and I want, if you allow me, I want also to say something uh, to, to pay tribute to, uh, to Christina and uh, the World uh, Green Building Council. Because one thing we didn't say is that in the, uh, in the, in the, in the construction sector, it's, a, it's, it's very a fragmented anti-value chain. And I, I think Saint-Gobain is a key player and we have a big part of the answers with our materials, but we need to collaborate to find a solution with many other players. So we, and, and very different players. So uh, green building councils are extremely important for that if we want to move forward. Margaret, I wonder whether I could go to you, uh, having listened to the last three speakers, uh, did anything kind of jump out at you uh, did you find anything particularly relevant to the way the, the finance industry thinks about these issues? You know, so, so much of it uh, jumped out. Tony's comments, and, and it's actually interesting. I, you know, I met Tony for the first time. She might not even remember 13 years ago when she was helping rethink all of the you know, zoning and land use in Newark, which is kind of a great example of a lot of the things that she was talking about. This was a you know, place, a, you know, an underserved city in many ways, many underserved people. And one of the things that her and her team drove was how do you reinvigorate the downtown, right? And that's something that drove economic development, mainstream development. But as we think about climate change, it's like, what do you do when you reinvigorate a downtown that has amazing public transportation right in the middle of it? You take advantage of a walkable city while you're also creating jobs, creating opportunities. And I think what was exciting about just rethinking of those moments as she was speaking that was collaboration between the public sector, driving the land use, driving the zoning, creating incentives, and also the private sector, right? You know, Goldman Sachs came in and, you know, I think in, in her time frame invested a couple hundred million to now we're at, you know, we've invested over a billion. And all of that work, we were able to do um, so many things, right? We were addressing climate change. We didn't really call it that. We didn't speak about it that way. But it was that collaboration allowed us to get to, to some of those outcomes. So certainly that that resonated with me. And then, you know, Sheila's point about, you know, the the informal uh, housing community, I, you know, I thought about it a little bit different. But in the same way that we need to drive this collaboration, her comments made me think about, you know, Local Law 97 here in New York. It's, it's well-intended. It's going to drive great outcomes. 
it requires building owners of a certain size to reduce their carbon emissions by a certain point. Now, unfortunately for the large office buildings, the large residential landlords, they're going to be able to make those changes because they're going to have the access to capital to do so. But I think when that law was created, there wasn't as much thought about the, you know, four-story walk-up in the Bronx that's owned by the mom and pops. Again, going back to some of the communities and stakeholders that Tony was speaking about. And so, you know, we're actually working with a company called Block Power, uh, minority-owned, very innovative CEO, Donnell Baird, and he's trying to figure out the innovative financial solutions to get that same walk-up, you know, owner in the Bronx, the same electric heating and cooling equipment that is so much more accessible to larger entities. So I think, you know, my takeaway from some of the conversation is one about focusing on the underserved populations and the places where we need to go, but then also figuring out the collaborations we need between the private sector and the public sector to make some of those solutions actually uh, doable and and effective. Um, Thanks, Margaret. Tony, I want to actually turn to you uh, and ask a question based on a conversation we had earlier. I'm sort of interested in whether the pandemic uh, is was a a positive learning experience that we we can we can all benefit from, or actually a depressing confirmation of uh, of some things that perhaps we didn't know how bad they were in our society. Um, and you know we've all touched on this issue that it was the most vulnerable uh, who were disproportionately hit by the pandemic, and we leaned on the bus drivers and the grocery store uh, shelving workers and others. Uh, to keep our economy running when those of us who had the luxury to uh, take off and go to country houses outside the city um, did so. So I'm just wondering from your perspective, having thought about issues of white flight generations ago uh, in places like Newark and Detroit, whether you look at the pandemic as sort of merely a sad confirmation of what we already knew, or did you draw lessons from it that would give you some hope for the future as we think about how cities will adjust to climate change? Well, yes, it was a sad (laughs) reminder. Uh, I think, especially depending on who you are and where you're working, of a set of conditions that pre-exist and are always felt really acutely by different types of economic or environmental crises. And so you now saw a health crisis, you know, rendering the same devastating effects to the same devastating population in the same devastated areas of a city. So I think now we've hit the trifecta of understanding that uh, there are significant economic impacts on the folks and systems that everyone on this call relies on and we don't really give a second thought to. And so I would hope now, and I think we are seeing movements in the ways in which philanthropy and the corporate sector are rethinking their relationships as well as their investment strategies within cities that are addressing these people and places, I think in a different way, which is really encouraging. Thank you, Margaret, for reminding me of our uh, previous exchange in Newark. I'm now working in Chicago, a much bigger city, but on the south side of Chicago, where these issues in Newark or Detroit, you know, you find them in my hometown of Chicago too. But what's really exciting there and what we're already beginning to have conversations about related to Margaret's One Million Black Women initiative is the overlay of how we're lifting up black women and their opportunity as one of the fastest growing sectors of starting businesses to begin to create a system where they can withstand the shocks of these environmental health and economic crises because of the ways in which they maybe have more energy efficient um, household uh, expenses, the ways in which they can more efficiently live and work in the communities that they've been rooted to, the ways in which they can care for their children, and the ways in which often found in African-American communities the self-reliance sort of spirit of community, uh, community service, can really begin to create a more collaborative um, opportunity that allows a Goldman Sachs to come in and reinvest and shore up that capacity that's been working collaboratively. So I am really hopeful that it seems like the systems of capital 
are, are coming together with the systems of nonprofit and anchor institutions on the ground to do this work in a different way, which I believe is really important if we're to meet the scale of these challenges, requires us to think differently about the scale in which we must work together and reinvest. Um, Pierre-André, I said to you earlier, I was going to come back to you on a big question, which is uh, something I think you've thought about a lot, which is sort of the, the, the notion of nature in the city and what makes cities livable. Um, so I'm going to ask you to talk about that a little bit, and then I want to put you on the spot. Which cities in the world, uh, and you can't say Paris because that's cheating, um, which cities in the world do you consider most livable and why? Uh, well, for, you know, it's a topic, uh, cities, which I think is uh, encompassing a lot of what we said. I, I just uh, uh, wrote a book on uh, what I call the urban challenge, uh, which is, in fact, because 70 percent of the CO2 emissions in the world are in cities, which is 2 percent of the surface. And it's going to be a huge part of the population of the world. And, and, and today, and with the pandemic, people are afraid of cities huh? uh, 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 and, and, and because it's also pollution, the city. So, but, but we will be in cities. So we need to find ways to, for the cities to be enjoyable again, to be reviving. And I think it's about uh, renovating. Uh, and as uh, was said in the introduction, re, uh, um, uh, energy savings in cities by better buildings, you know, is, uh, ticks all the boxes about comfort, uh, well-being. Uh, and we need to make the, the city we, with more nature. Uh, you, you, if you ask me, you know, one city where there is plenty of nature, it's a big city. But I, I, I love London from that standpoint with all their parks, you know. And, and, uh, and I think we need to bring, to bring uh, back in many cities, we need to bring back a little more nature. There are plenty of experiments from architects on that. Uh, we need to have a mixed city from a, a inclusion. Uh, and we need to, uh, to, uh, to work on the quality of life within the city, because most of us at the world level will live in cities in the future. Excellent. Um, I want to, Christina, if I could come back to you again. Uh, we talked earlier about the net zero carbon buildings commitment, and you, you laid that out, and, and I think it struck a number of the people on the panel. I wanted to sort of ask you a different question, which is how do you communicate um, these very complex ambitions in a way that humanizes the transition and makes clear the opportunity to all stakeholders. It's, it's easy sometimes for these things to seem rather abstract. And I'm wondering, uh, as one who's in this business and thinks about it, how do you make it meaningful on a human level to people? Yeah, so the challenge. The challenge is how to scale up solutions, right, to address climate action in the built environment, as Nigel Topping said in the introduction. And we've gone around in different scales of the solution. However, we have a big communication gap with the general audience on what this means really to, you know, how does it all translate? And I guess a common thread that I've heard today is that we are all talking about the urgent need for quality infrastructure with traits that benefits all, hmm? even in, from informal, informal settlements to uh, any, any sorts of solutions in cities across the world that can help us know, go in this journey towards a better world. So in that communication gap, I see a great sense of opportunity in what we've lived in the pandemic. Health and well-being is at the heart of the climate action ask. And if we really do a case to explain that healthy buildings are also efficient buildings and, are, and take us on a journey to ensure that our quality of life is the best possible, is, is a good way to go. Because without, without that link, that human link, and bringing people into the conversation, we won't be able, we won't be successful to explain that buildings are a critical solution to climate change. And I, I guess that's our big, biggest challenge in this group, as of course in our different day-to-day uh, -day works, in our different, different uh, journeys, have an influence in where we want to make a positive impact. I think that's the biggest challenge. Well, thanks, Christina. Um, Sheila, if I could turn to you and, and ask the question, because I think it's an even more challenging one with uh, the people in the informal housing sector. I mean, how uh, do governments, uh, corporations, and anyone else try to humanize this question for people whose daily lives are already a matter of 
uh, living hand to mouth, of, of, of lacking security, lacking proper health care, in some cases lacking proper nutrition. Um, how do you persuade people whose daily lives are already so difficult um, of the need to think about these issues and make a transition? So let me start off by saying that there is no need to start it. If you take poor women who live informally, uh, all the issues that Christina was talking about are at the center of their obsession for transformation. Their ability to work as communities, as neighborhoods will shame anybody. And the way in which these communities have survived the pandemic uh, has to be seen to be believed because in 60% of the households, by the third week, there was no food. But it was redistributed by everybody in the neighborhood to see that nobody was hungry. So the, the community spirit, the aspirations to be good, to do good, to be part of the city is there. But we have antiquated uh, laws of land. If you look at these uh, norms and standards of cities, uh, there is no transition for these people whose houses the state will not build, for which there is no money, to come into a qualitatively safe, resilient space. And a lot of the disruptive, negative, terrible buildings. In, in a hot tropical cities, we have glass buildings. You know, you talk about standards. Then they put on air conditioning to cool it. So you have this, this distortions on the one end of the spectrum that are seen as the temples of modernity by our politicians, by our bureaucracy, by our educational systems. So the, the, the whole world has to transform its value systems because it's, it's very cheap talk to say, leave nobody behind to have a just transition. You know, all these words sound beautiful in, in these sort of discussions. But my network, the Shack Dwellers International, works in 33 countries and in 586 cities. And in every city, there are communities that are producing evidence of change that they need, they want, that they can participate in. We don't have engagements that will help do this leapfrogging. We don't have systems. So all of you who are involved in global institutions, be they finance, be they, uh, you know, your, your associations, construction companies, I'm going to go after these construction companies to say, at least invent those things and make them available. There's a whole informal construction, whole industry that will take it forward. But they are now aping the stuff they they want to put more concrete more steel because that's supposed to be imitating the formal system so we have a long way to go but there is no shortage of aspiration and if you look at you know all our countries have almost 50 percent people who are less than 30 years old they are global citizens they want change they want transformation so there's no shortage of aspiration desire readiness to do things there's just a lack of a framework within which this can happen. Um, Jillian, let me come to you maybe for the final word on this. Uh, both maybe answering what Sheila said as you're in the property development business. Um, also addressing that question I asked Christina about how do you humanize this transition. And if you want to slip a, a small plug for Bream in there, I promised that to you earlier. So feel free in your answer if you want. Yes, thanks very much, Mark. Well, I, I completely recognise and, and acknowledge the challenge that uh, Sheila has laid out there. And uh, one of the things that we're involved in as BRE is working with um, the industry to develop um, modern methods of construction. And that's not just for developing um, nation opportunities, it's for, for us all. Um, I'm involved at the moment, for instance, in a discussion about the role that timber can play. Um, that is uh, much more sustainable, but unfortunately, as we all know, uh, there are big safety issues. 
And I think that uh, certainly for us as BRE, bringing together the challenge of safety and with sustainability is another big opportunity and challenge for city development. And then the other point I wanted to make, and this is where Breen comes in, to think about uh, the, the uh, creating a, a much more standardised and solid basis for judging um, sustainability outcomes. And that's what Bream is concerned with. It's a sci building science base for certifying built assets and construction projects. And it takes into account all of the things that we've been talking about, it, not just the building, the health of the building, embodied carbon, the management of the building, um, and the land use around the building. So these holistic ways of um, looking at assets, built assets, I think are really important. And we need much more, I would say, sharing and standardization um, so that we can scale up. These are massive challenges. If you look at what we've done for COVID to collaborate, to share ideas, to scale up, um, we have to re replicate that, uh, you know, in in a million times over to address this this challenge. Well, uh, we're running short of time, but I did want to throw it to Christina for just a, ver a very last, uh, a relatively brief observation on, and it kind of builds off of what uh, Jillian was just saying. If the scale of this is so massive, how do you get all the various sectors to work together? How does government and business and civil society, how big a challenge is that? And what's the most effective way to get these sectors pulling in the same direction? Thank you. Yes. So let's say our theory of change, if you like, in the global network and all the actors that are supporting this cause in the race to zero and going into COP26, basically, the theory is that we create opportunity and there's the movers and the leaders that are creating this momentum and in new ways of doing business, governments will have the realization that bold regulation is possible and is necessary. And it's important to have global, regional, local networks because we don't want what Sheila is saying. We don't want, we want solutions that are for place, for culture, for the needs of the people that are affordable, but are the highest quality possible. It's about that conversation, that journey. It takes a lot of collaboration, as Pierre Andre said, but that's, that, that's it. What mm -hmm. things that matter are difficult and what is difficult is worth it. And I think I want to honor everyone that has been in this panel because your work is amazing and the inspiration is, is so big to continue on bringing down the principles to make them relevant for country, for places, communities, and any sort of communities, because people need need quality infrastructure. We need to do away with pollution, and carbon is pollution. Christina, thank you. That's a hopeful note on which to end this, and uh, and a really well a really well said one. Um, I think this has been a challenging and very thoughtful conversation. And speaking for myself, I, I I've learned a lot more about the challenges at play and the opportunities. Uh, from all of you. So so my thanks uh, to all of you for joining this conversation. Um, and my thanks also to the audience for the very uh, smart questions that you sent in. I will now hand the mic off to my colleague, Whitney Richardson, who is in person with Thomas Heatherwick in London. Whitney and my colleague, Bill of the NYT Magazine, will speak with Thomas about his vision and how he is redefining the ways in which we experience and think about the built environment. Thank you so much, Mark, for that incredible discussion so far. And now that we've discussed scaling and accelerating solutions in the climate space for where we live and work, I am thrilled to introduce you to two people, Thomas Heatherwick, designer and founder of Heatherwick Studios. We're here in his studio today in London as well as Bill Wasik, deputy editor of the New York Times Magazine. The magazine just launched an entire issue dedicated to climate, which Bill will tell us a little bit more about shortly. Thank you so much, Thomas, for having us in your studio today. I am so pleasure. excited to be pleasure, speaking pleasure, with pleasure. you. Thank you for coming. Thank you. And for those of you who've seen his work, I'm sure many of you have, Thomas's work is sprinkled around the world from Shanghai to New York, to London, to California, and most recently, Little Island in New York, which is incredible. I cannot wait to see it. So thinking about the last year, 
it's fair to say that many of us have been forced to think a little bit more deeply about how our living spaces impact our well-being and the well-being of the environment. We've seen many major cities clear out as people move to the suburbs, and we've also seen office spaces completely abandoned. How has the past year impacted how you think about your designs? And how do you think it will be impacted in the future, just from the past year? I suppose when I set up my studio 26 years ago, I assumed I'd be working by myself in isolation from the world in that my interest in how you could humanize places around, it felt like the world didn't want that. There were very set ideas of what an office was and how you did housing. And it, it felt like things had settled into fixed versions of themselves. And the space for invention and different ways of doing those things wasn't available. And then to my surprise, actually, that human-centric design, it seemed like the, there was a space for that. And we started to be able to do certain projects. And rather than seeing design and architecture as a thing that comes from above by people who know better than all of us, I'd always felt that that's where things had gone wrong. And projects assumed that the public weren't intelligent, smart people who can see and feel and intuit and have emotion. Whether you've studied architectural history or town planning or not, you can feel where places don't work. So the, the COVID crisis and this tragedy that's existed, when I try to look at the positive side of that, the positive side is it's busted lazy placemaking and the dumb stuff. I think we'll look back in astonishment in a, in a century and say, did we really go into those buildings which you couldn't open a window? And we all sat on these plasticized desking systems with some construct of our professional selves that we thought we had to create. So in a sense, I feel that this is just a, a sort of turbo jump more to making places that are more focused on human experience. And that's what we'd been incrementally trying to do, whether that was working on a new kind of bus or a new public space or a new working environment. They still could get dismissed by people as, oh, you're, that's just novelty or that's putting plants is a greenwash. That's what it is. I've read recently that you've been getting into biophilia, if that's the right word, where it's this idea that humans and nature should be as closely integrated as possible. When you're thinking about your designs, how do they benefit both people and the environment? And did I get the concept of biophilia correct? Biophilia is a funny term. And we were first sort of learning all about it when we were commissioned to design the headquarters for Google in California and in London. Google as engineers the analytical side was wonderful for us from the experiential side to collaborate with them. I thought that bi biophilia to start off with, I thought, is that just a stupid science word for plants are good? But actually it's about emotion and how you make places that aren't sterile, monotonous and unnatural. So biophilia is not just about plants, just putting plants, but plants add some complexity that is a sort of truth about about life itself somehow and I think that the big realization that society together is coming to is that the modernist mindset that said that form follows function and that is great I believe in that but I think that the key thing that was missing there was that emotion was a function so if you make a building that doesn't actually connect with people's real sense of emotion, it's, you'll, it'll get knocked down and it won't get sustained and reused. We love finding ways to reuse ex older buildings when we love them. And so it sounds so soppy to say that without love, there is no sustainability. I appreciate that sentiment of love being part of sustainability and design. 
Um, I, I want to bring in Bill now um, to hear a little bit more about what you've explored, uh, your team has explored for the magazine, um, if any of these themes are resonating based on what Thomas has just shared with us. And if you have any questions for Thomas, I'd love to, to bring you in, Bill, to, to jump right in. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, and thank you, Whitney. Um, the magazine issue that we've just launched um, is on the theme of try everything, reflecting the realization that as much as we've all disagreed over the years about the right way forward on climate change, that we're now in a position where we need to use every possible tool in the toolbox. So we talk about politics, we talk about law, we talk about innovation, and the idea being that this isn't an either or situation that we essentially need to basically throw everything at the wall. And Thomas, I think your work is a great illustration of this because even in the design space, right, we need design that helps us pollute less. And we also need design that helps us adapt to, unfortunately, the changes that are, are already here and that and that uh, we know are coming. Um, so I would love to begin by talking a, about Little Islands. Um, you know, as a New Yorker, every time there's a new park or a new public space, we all rejoice because we don't have nearly enough of them. Um, and by all accounts, what you've created uh, in Lower Manhattan is, is an incredibly delightful space. But climate change uh, is part of the origin story, as I understand it, in terms of you uh, and your and your team and the other stakeholders recognizing in the aftermath of Hurricane Sandy that uh, that that the the whole shape of it had to be different. And I, I would love to hear you talk a little bit about about that process. Well, we it's funny you you mentioned about uh, Hurricane Sandy because the day of the competition presentation, the final presentation, was the day of Hurricane Sandy. So, wow. so we, we made the, the presentation to the Hudson River Park Trust and the team who were all supporting uh, to make it happen and walked out unknowing what would happen into New York. And then the, the wind hit, the water hit, and we were, we were marooned in, <laughs> in places we never thought we would be, in ways we'd never been before. And the original pier that was already a bit damaged got that much more damaged by Hurricane Sandy. So it was a sort of extra impetus that something really did need to happen with this project. The immediate things were that the river authorities changed the height that you build to. We needed to raise our general level of the structure that much higher. But the, we already knew that whatever we built needed to be able to take the, the, the elements hitting it. And we'd researched and spent time looking at all the other piers and looking at the way the materials age and the, the planting that got used to, to really have a sense of what we were working with. Because it's lovely, on a lovely day, everything looks gorgeous in the world, but you're designing for those, the toughest times and you're right there out over the water. You're out over a piece of sea somehow. So that was a big part of it. But now that we're contemplating sea level rise all around the world in some way or another, this emotional side is so important again in that it's so easy for specialisms to feel that within their urgency of their own issue, it, which in this case is particularly civil engineering, trumps everything else and to forget that the human side can stitch together with that you can and i've seen this i've seen examples where people have built sea defenses that completely disconnect the water from communities but there are ways that you can humanize defensive barriers but it means you have to believe and have an optimism that you can do both and that this isn't about throwing money at problems. It's about thinking of the human together with this other function. Um, so switching gears, uh, I would love to talk about this uh, new concept car that your studio just unveiled. Beyond adaptation, of course, there's this necessity that we all find ways to, to pollute much, much less. And, you know, here in the United States, of course, where the, the car sort of created a whole kind of post-war culture. Um, it's really intriguing, this idea that an electric car uh, that can 
you know, not just run on zero pollution, but actually actively clean the air as it drives. And I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about the thought process that went into this car um, and the uh, the way that you feel like it might change some of the, the psychology of driving. Well, I suppose the first thing to say is cars aren't the only solution to transportation. So I think they're part of it. I'm re- very interested in how you get people together and the infrastructure through transportation is often one of a key way, but there is an important role in, in the world for individual vehicles as well. It just seems that the key thing is, what are you really adding? Is it, are you just going to make a styling improvement or can you keep pushing progress forward in some way? And can every little thing be making some small step change towards the best things can be. So we reflected on the risk of smugness in electric car drivers driving along thinking, ha ah, I'm not polluting, but actually they still are. There's still particles coming off braking pads and tires. And it seemed rather than just thinking you're not doing bad, how do you actually make something that might positively contribute? And so that's what led to us thinking, well, we've all spent a lot of time thinking about the impact of what we breathe in the last year and a half and spending a lot of time with inhaling and exhaling and thinking about filtration. And it seemed, well, what if we could use the amazing advances in battery power to just take a tiny bit of additional power to be helping to like, like flypaper, you've got these vehicles moving around and potentially there will be a million of these cars. The difference that they could make as they move through urban polluted areas to be cap- capturing what the cars, lorries, motorcycles and other cars are still putting out as pollutant. Um, felt, felt that once you th- thought that thought, you couldn't unthink it. So that was one side of it. And the other side is the space crisis that's happening around the world where we have more and more of us and the COVID crisis highlighted that where many of us think we live in an okay place. But then when we were stuck needing to speak in privacy on Zoom calls or video conferencing and suddenly found ourselves huddling in our bedroom round to try and find privacy, see, well, there are over a billion cars in the world and those cars are being used for a fraction of their lives. So it seemed that there could be two aspects to the car. One side was positive contribution environmentally in capturing pollution, but the other side was, could we make a functional room? And so the idea of making a real working space or a dining space to bring people together, and I think in the different projects we're working on in society, we need to bring people together, physically bring them together. It's about multi-use. And I think we're all realizing our lives now might be less binary. So why shouldn't vehicles and transportation be part of that? Following on Bill's question, I'm, I'm just curious about the sectors that you think need to be adjusted so that your ambitions can be scaled. What types of sectors need to be changed and how would you how would you change them if you if you could? Well, I mean, I feel very lucky to be here being even asked these kinds of questions and having had the chance to work on the 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 projects that we're starting to work on. My motivation underneath everything and as a architect designer studio, you you get asked to do certain things, but that doesn't necessarily mean what you get asked to do is the only thing that should be happening. But what I'm excited by is to try to make the worst things better rather than things that are already good a bit better. When you look at the worst places in society around us, they're often medical environments and particularly spaces like care homes. It doesn't sound like a sexy thing to work on, but in the UK, a very large number of people died in the care homes There was already a lot of emphasis on a weird care care system that's astonishingly uncaring and particularly uncaring about the carers. And you want the environments about care to be thanking those people who are going to be looking after the you and me and each other. 
And, and you then look at the healthcare system and the hospitals and community centers and it, it just, and schools. And so many of these places are astonishingly bad from a human point of view. You know, you look back at some of the hospitals built in the Victorian times and they, they had fresh air built in. They also had beauty. They dared to say, we, we have beauty. We believe that including whatever beauty means, that that will help people to get better quicker. I hope that we can move from this sense of the great philanthropists putting their emphasis on arts institutions to putting that emphasis more into the places that are unloved in society around us. Put love where you don't expect it, rather than it always being where you do and where it's for just a limited elite. I think there's lots of space for unexpected commissioning and putting emphasis that will actually inspire others and grow a broader panorama of what the world around us, I think, can be and should be. Bill, did you find uh, similar sentiments uh, when working on the magazine in terms of sectors that we should be thinking about to accelerate solutions? Um, was there anything that, that resonated with you here? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think that one of the things that came through in a lot of the coverage in our issue is, is inequality, right? The fact that, I mean, we have a lovely essay from a poet from the Bahamas about the devastation of Hurricane Dorian there a, a few years ago and, the, and the, the degree to which the wealthy nations that are responsible for pollution are not uh, sort of rising to their obligation to help the nations that, that are suffering from climate change. I mean, I think you see that between nations. I think you see it within nations. Um, and I believe that it does sort of come back around in a way to a sense of of a shared sort of obligation and a sense of a shared uh, purpose. Um, and so, you know, our, our perspective from this issue was that we need to use the tools, uh, the, the, the international legal tools, the national legal tools, we need to use financial tools. Um, but we also need uh, to persuade, we need to change people's minds, we need to, to, to have people take ownership, we need them to take ownership collectively, we need them to take ownership individually. Um, and there's a way in which talking about inequality and talking about uh, who, who, you know, who deserves to blame for the problem that we're in, um, it, it, there's an inherently divisive aspect to that, but we somehow need to be able to to sort of make progress on those issues, uh, even as we need for um, for individuals to feel like like they have a sort of positive uh, connection with the change that has to be made. And it, it's it's a devilish set of problems, but I do think that a, a lot of this kind of thinking uh, that 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 Thomas has done about trying to to sort of associate these issues with, 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 with love and with a kind of positive emotional reaction, I think winds up feeling like the only way forward. Thank you so much, Bill. Thank you so much, Thomas, for your Thank time you. today. This has been an incredible discussion. Um, I will definitely on my next trip to New York visit Little Island, and I cannot wait to get my hands on the latest New York Times magazine dedicated to climate. So Bill, please save a copy for me. And thank you so much. And Mark, back over to you in London. Thank you to Whitney, Bill, and Thomas for such an inspiring interview. A special thank you to all of the speakers for your insightful commentary and contributions to the conversation. If you enjoyed today's discussion, we look forward to welcoming each of you in September to our next digital event in the Netting Zero series, Transport and Logistics for a Post-COVID Net Zero World. You can sign up for that session with the link in the YouTube chat. Thank you.